In a world filled with constant updates, social media posts, and the need to share every little detail of our lives, there's a valuable lesson that often goes unnoticed. Why you should never tell anyone what you're up to. It might sound counterintuitive in a time where oversharing is the norm, but trust me, there's wisdom in this principle. From sharing our morning breakfast to documenting our holidays, our triumphs, and even our trials, we've become accustomed to unveiling our lives on social media. And if not on the digital stage, then within our immediate social circles. It seems as though there's a constant pressure to spill the beans on everything we're doing. But here's the question that deserves contemplation. Do we truly need to lay bare every detail of our journey to everyone who cares to listen? Let's take a moment to reflect on something we've all seen. Those individuals who love to proclaim big things coming on Instagram or other social platforms. It's as if they find more fulfillment in posting about their dreams and aspirations than actually pursuing them. They bask in the validation they receive for their grand announcements. But sadly, these announcements often remain unfulfilled promises. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing inherently wrong with sharing your goals or dreams with friends and family. However, it becomes an issue when you spend more time talking about your plans than taking action to achieve them. It's like a person who talks about going on a diet every day, but never actually starts eating healthier or hitting the gym. In the spiritual realm, we can draw valuable insights from this behavior. Wise individuals understand that actions speak louder than words. They prioritize doing the work rather than announcing their intentions. This concept isn't about being secretive. It's about dedicating your energy to meaningful progress rather than seeking validation through empty declarations. Proverbs 23.7 reminds us that as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So what's in your heart? Are you a person who talks endlessly about your dreams but fails to manifest them? Or are you someone who prefers to let your actions speak for themselves? Rich people in spirit embrace a willingness to learn and grow. They don't cling stubbornly to their opinions, but remain open to new perspectives. Their constant pursuit of knowledge and understanding keeps them flexible and adaptable. They don't feel the need to broadcast every thought or decision, but rather they focus on continuous improvement. On the other hand, those who lack spiritual wealth tend to believe that they have all the answers. They shout their opinions from the rooftops, drowning out opposing viewpoints. Their rigidity prevents them from evolving, adapting, and ultimately from growing as individuals. In the Bible, Proverbs 17, 28 reminds us that even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. The wisdom in this verse lies in the power of silence and restraint. It's about choosing when to speak and when to listen, rather than always being the loudest voice in the room. Let me tell you, dear friends, there's a profound wisdom in being discerning about what you share. The Bible in James 1, verse 19, gently reminds us, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. These words hold a timeless truth that resonates deeply within our topic today. There is a reason we should be slow to speak, especially when it comes to our dreams and plans. Think about the farmer and his seed. He didn't parade around the town eagerly sharing his dream of a bountiful harvest with everyone he met. No, he knew there's a delicate balance between nurturing a dream and exposing it prematurely to the world. Just as he cared for that seed in silence, we too should exercise discretion and wisdom in guarding our dreams until they've had time to take root and grow. Revealing your plans too soon can have unintended consequences. Sometimes, sharing your goals with the wrong people can lead to discouragement, doubt, or even jealousy. Remember, not everyone will see your vision the way you do. And sometimes, those closest to us might unintentionally dampen our enthusiasm with well-intended but discouraging advice. But there's another side to this wisdom. Keeping your plans hidden allows you to work diligently and without distraction. It enables you to focus solely on nurturing your dreams without the external pressures and opinions that may sway you off course. So, my dear friends, consider this a call to action. 
Learn from the farmer's wisdom. Cultivate your dreams with care. Nurture them in silence. And when the time is right, when they have taken root and grown strong, then and only then share the fruits of your labor with the world. In Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus imparts this wisdom. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. This message carries profound meaning for us, one that can change the way we approach life. Just like the baby bird's nest, our secret place holds great significance. Your secret place could be that quiet room where you pour out your heart in prayer. It might be that serene spot under a tree where you immerse yourself in the teachings of the Bible. Or perhaps it's the intimate space within your heart where you have heartfelt conversations with God. What makes this secret place truly special is that it's a sanctuary away from the cacophony of the world. A place free from prying eyes and judgmental words. In this sacred space, it's just you and God forging a unique and personal connection. Much like the baby bird, your time in this secret place is crucial for your growth. It's where you learn, where you evolve, and where you strengthen your faith. But remember, not everyone needs to witness this transformation. Just as the baby bird doesn't invite everyone to its nest, your spiritual growth is a private journey, a beautiful secret shared only between you and God. So why should you keep your endeavors, your dreams, and your plans close to your heart, revealing them only to the Creator? It's because the heart of man is said to be wicked. Who can truly know it? Proverbs 17.9 reminds us that our secrets are safer with God than with anyone else. When you keep your dreams hidden, you shield them from the naysayers and doubters who may inadvertently quench your spirit. Let your secret place be the breeding ground of your aspirations. Nurture your dreams in the quietude of your heart, away from the distractions and criticisms of the world. Trust in God's promise that He sees your efforts, even when they're shrouded in secrecy. In due time, your faith, your goals, and your dreams will take flight, just like that baby bird leaving its nest. Think of Nehemiah, a dedicated servant of God, tirelessly laboring to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. His task was monumental, and distractions were abundant. There were voices calling him, beckoning him to step away from his divine mission. But Nehemiah possessed a deep understanding of the value of focus. In Nehemiah 6, 3, he declared, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Nehemiah refused to let the distractors divert him from his vital work. We can glean wisdom from Nehemiah's unwavering commitment. Often we share our dreams and plans with others, seeking support and encouragement. However, sometimes well-intentioned friends or even acquaintances can unknowingly become stumbling blocks. They might not comprehend our vision, or their words could sow seeds of doubt in our hearts. That's when the wisdom of silence becomes invaluable. That's a time to nurture your dreams secretly, to shield them from distractions and potential negativity. It doesn't mean you lack trust in others, but rather you recognize the sanctity of your mission. Just like Nehemiah, keep your focus and let your work speak for itself. In the book of Proverbs 4.23, we're reminded, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Guarding your heart includes safeguarding your dreams and ambitions. When you have a purpose to fulfill, it's not necessary to share it with the world immediately. Instead, pour your energy into your work, into your goals, and into your relationship with God. Remember that God's timing is perfect. When the moment is right, you'll have the opportunity to share your testimony, to reveal your journey. But until then, let your actions speak louder than words. Let us think back to a moment in the Bible, a moment when Jesus performed a miraculous healing in the town of Bethsaida. The story found in the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 22 to 26, illustrates a profound lesson. A blind man was brought before Jesus, and the people pleaded for his divine touch. Jesus, in his compassion, took the blind man's hand and led him out of the town with tender care. He placed his hands on the man's eyes and asked, Do you see anything? 
At first, the blind man's vision was unclear. He could only discern vague shapes, like trees walking. But Jesus didn't give up on him. He placed his hands on the man's eyes once more, and this time, the man's sight was completely restored. The once blind man could now see everyone clearly. A testament to the miraculous power of faith and perseverance. Yet what comes next in the story is equally profound. Jesus, in his wisdom, instructed the man not to return to the town or tell anyone in the town about his miraculous healing. Why, you might wonder. It was because Jesus understood the imperfections of the world we live in. In our imperfect world, there are individuals who may not rejoice in our successes, but instead seek to exploit our vulnerabilities and use our information against us. Just as the blind man was instructed to keep his newfound sight a secret, there are moments when we must be discerning about whom we share our struggles and aspirations with. Psychology teaches us that we project our sense of self-worth onto various aspects of our lives. The car we drive, the clothes we wear, our relationships, and even the problems we face. When we discuss our challenges openly, we inadvertently remind others of their own difficulties, potentially driving them away. People naturally gravitate towards those who make them feel strong, happy, secure, and confident. True empathy arises when someone else can relate to our pain because they've walked a similar path. When someone genuinely understands our struggles because they've faced them, they become a beacon of support and encouragement. But sharing is caring, right? Well, not always. Here's the thing. Most people don't genuinely care about your dreams. And even worse, some can't resist the temptation to spread your private matters like wildfire. So here's the first lesson. Be mindful of how much of yourself you share with others. In the Bible, Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. This ancient wisdom reminds us that our dreams and desires are precious, and not everyone is equipped to handle them with care. But wait, let me share a story with you. There once was a farmer who planted a seed. Instead of broadcasting it to the world, he carefully nurtured it shielded it from harsh weather, and allowed it to grow strong roots. Only when the plant was robust and ready did he proudly display its bountiful fruits. Likewise, we should nurture our dreams in the soil of our hearts before we reveal them to others. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should never share your aspirations with anyone. We all need a support system, trusted friends who uplift us and help us grow. But even with your closest confidants, exercise caution. Set boundaries on how much you disclose and when you do it. Remember, not all advice is good advice, and not everyone will understand your journey. This approach isn't just about protecting your dreams from naysayers or gossip mongers. It's about safeguarding your peace of mind. When you keep your goals close to your heart, you shield them from unnecessary scrutiny and judgment. You create a safe space for your dreams to flourish without fear or interference. So, my friends, let's embrace the wisdom of guarding our dreams. Let them grow in the fertile soils of our hearts until they're strong enough to withstand the storms of life. And when the time is right, when you achieve your dreams and they've become a reality, that's when you can proudly share your success with the world. Have you ever experienced a dream that left you feeling uncertain? It's quite common to be concerned about the nature of our dreams and wonder if they might be a way God communicates with us, guiding us towards certain actions. Interestingly, scientific research confirmed that about 95% of dreams slip from our memory by the time we get out of bed. Isn't that interesting? This happens because various factors influence the content of our dreams. However, the dreams we'll be exploring in this video are not easily forgotten. These dreams stand out from the rest, leaving a lasting impression. Today I'll be unveiling the top five dreams that signal God's calling for you. It's a blessing to have you here. And by the end of this video, you'll gain insights into why you've been experiencing some specific dreams. My dear friend, understanding these dreams is crucial as they indicate a divine calling. And I'm excited to share what steps you should take when you notice these significant dreams. Stay tuned. 
let's explore the profound messages that these dreams carry for your journey ahead. The Bible teaches us that dreams can be predictive. They have the potential to reveal what is about to happen or offer hints about future events. The Bible is also filled with stories of individuals who had significant dreams, and these dreams played pivotal roles in shaping the course of their lives. By exploring our dreams through the lens of the Holy Scriptures, we can uncover valuable insights that serve us useful tools to navigate our journey in life. This mindset will allow us to align our actions with God's guidance, providing clarity and direction for our path ahead. Before I show you these top five dreams, let us look at what dreams are and how true they can be. A common question that often arises is whether God communicates through dreams. The answer is a resounding yes. The Bible affirms that God uses dreams as a means of communication, not only with Christians, but also with non-Christians. Take, for instance, Pharaoh's dream, a powerful example where God fulfilled his promises to Joseph through a dream. Despite Pharaoh being an unbeliever, the dream held validity, showcasing that God can indeed speak to those who may not follow the Christian faith. Similarly, in the book of Daniel, we find the account of King Nebuchadnezzar, who was troubled by a forgotten dream. Despite consulting his wise men, astrologers, philosophers, and scientists, the dream remained elusive. However, through the prayers of Daniel and his friends, God revealed the dream to them, providing both the dreams and its interpretation to the king. These examples illustrate that God communicates through dreams, even to non-believers. If this holds true for those outside the Christian faith, it certainly applies to believers as well. In many cases, dreams serve as a significant channel through which God imparts messages to his children. Joel chapter 2, verse 28 supports this, stating, And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. This verse emphasizes that dreaming is one of the ways God speaks to his people, providing them with insights and guidance. The Bible makes it clear that God is the giver of dreams. He uses dreams as a means to communicate his intentions, share messages, or provide instructions to individuals. Consider the examples of Joseph, who received dreams about his future and God's plan for him, and Solomon, who had a dream where God expressed his pleasure with him, Another notable instance is Joseph, Mary's husband, who received multiple dreams containing crucial instructions to safeguard the life of the young child, Jesus. However, it's essential to issue a strong note of caution. While God can still speak through dreams today, we must be cautious and understand that the Bible is complete, revealing everything we need to know until Jesus comes again. This isn't to negate the possibility of God using dreams, visions, impressions, or a still small voice to communicate with us. However, any message, regardless of its form, must align completely with what God has already revealed in His Word. Dreams cannot replace the authority of Scripture in our lives. The Bible remains God's verified and most accurate way of speaking to His children. Now. Let's delve into the top five dreams that indicate God's calling for a significant assignment in your life. Come with me as we look at valuable insights that may shed light on the divine purpose unfolding in your journey. The first one is preaching or sharing the gospel. Dreaming about preaching or sharing the gospel is a powerful indicator that God might be calling you to the work of ministry. It's a remarkable dream, often serving as a foresight into what God envisions for your future. If you frequently experience this type of dream, my friend, I strongly recommend prayerfully considering and examining it, as it could be a divine sign that God is calling you. But please note that having this dream isn't necessarily an immediate call to action. Instead, it could be a gentle prompting from God, urging you to prepare adequately for a significant assignment in the future. Reflect on Romans chapter 10, verse 15, which states, and how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. From this, we understand that the feet of a preacher may bear wear and tear from the miles they traveled to spread the message of the cross. Despite their physical appearance, these feet are considered the most beautiful before God because they are engaged in the essential and wonderful work of sharing the good news. 
This will lead us to the second dream that God is calling you for a great assignment. The next one is angelic encounters. Angels, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, are not only messengers of God, but also servants to all of us who are heirs of salvation. Some individuals frequently experience interactions with God's angels in their dreams. If you find yourself having such angelic encounters, it's essential to take a moment for personal reflection and intensify your prayers. This could be a clear indication from God about a great assignment He wants you to fulfill, or He is trying to guide you in a particular direction. Consider the story of Manoah's wife, who had a remarkable encounter with an angel. This divine messenger provided instructions regarding the birth and life of Samson. When God sends His messengers, whether in dreams or real life, it's our responsibility to pay close attention to the messages they bring, as they often hold the key to the next phase of our lives. Reflect on the example of Moses, who encountered an angel of the Lord, not in a dream but through a burning bush. This encounter marked the beginning of a significant assignment that God had for him, as recorded in Exodus chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, Here I am. Similarly, think about Joseph, to whom the Lord appeared in a dream to instruct him about the safety of the child Jesus, as mentioned in Matthew chapter 2, verse 19. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. These instances emphasize the significance of angelic encounters in conveying God's messages and guiding individuals toward their divine assignment. Let's move on to the third dream, receiving a Bible. Many individuals frequently dream of receiving a copy of the Bible, and this could signify that God is entrusting you with the ministry of the Word. It may indicate a unique plan God has for you in spreading His teachings. If you often experience such dreams, it's advisable to dedicate prayerful time seeking to understand God's intentions for the great assignment He may have for you. Consider the example of the prophet Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, where God instructed him to eat a scroll before speaking to the people of Israel. This act symbolized taking in and internalizing the Word of God before sharing it with others. If you dream of receiving the Bible or a scroll, could be a sign that God is calling you to preach His word, like He called the prophet Ezekiel. That passage says, So I opened my mouth, and He gave me the scroll to eat. Then He said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. He then said to me, Son of man, go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. This kind of dream signifies as a divine calling to share the Word of God, and it's crucial to seek further understanding and confirmation from God. Now, let's explore the fourth dream, encountering a preacher in your dreams. If you frequently dream about a specific preacher, pay attention, as this could be a way God is indicating a special calling for you. In these dreams, the preacher may be providing guidance, instruction, or encouragement serving as a divine message to your heart about being set apart for a unique assignment. Take note of the preacher's ministry, message, and method, as they might hold clues about your own calling. For instance, if the preacher excels in the teaching ministry, it could be a sign that God is leading you into a similar teaching role. Alternatively, if the preacher has a testimony of overcoming a challenging past, it might signify that God plans to use you mightily despite your own past struggles. Sometimes, these dreams could be an opportunity for you to learn valuable lessons from the preacher's teachings. Let's move on to the fifth dream, the anointing oil. Dreaming of being anointed by a pastor, minister of the gospel, or even an angel of the Lord is a powerful sign that God is separating or calling you for a specific task. When you have such dreams, it's crucial to retreat, reflect, and seek understanding from God about the purpose of these dreams. 
The anointing signifies that God is entrusting you with a particular mission. Recall the significance of anointing in the consecration of priests, as mentioned in Exodus chapter 29, verse 7. Take the anointed oil and anoint him by pouring it on his head. It is a sacred act, symbolizing God's chosen ones for specific tasks. Jesus himself was anointed with the Holy Spirit after his baptism, as recorded in the Bible. Consider the words of the prophet in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Beloved, anointing, whether experienced in dreams or real life, is a significant indication of God's call and empowerment for a particular purpose. Trust in the Lord, seek His guidance, and await clarity on the task He has for you. In conclusion, these five types of dreams can serve as a significant sign that the Lord may be calling you. It's important to recognize and carefully consider these dreams, but the need to align them with the teachings of the Holy Scriptures is equally crucial. God's messages, whether conveyed through dreams or other means, will always be in harmony with His Word. If you ever have a dream and sense that it might be a message from God, take the time to prayerfully examine the Word of God. Ensure that your dreams align with the Holy Scriptures. If it does, then prayerfully consider the appropriate response to what God may be communicating to you. Remember, whenever someone experienced a dream from God in the Bible, the meaning was always made clear. God ensures that His messages are understood, whether delivered directly to the person through an angel or by another messenger. May God bless and guide you as you navigate the messages He may be conveying to you through your dreams. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay faithful to the Word, my friend. Seek His guidance and trust in His wisdom as you discern the path He has laid out for you. Consider for a moment a seed enveloped in the nurturing embrace of the soil. It's in the quiet, in the dark, where its transformation unfolds where its potential spirals into reality. Similarly, the Almighty often orchestrates periods of seclusion in our lives, not as a sentence of loneliness, but as a sacred rendezvous, where our souls can dance to the rhythm of divine wisdom unobserved. There's a sublime narrative in the Bible, the tale of Elijah in 1 Kings 17. The prophet is led by God to a secluded brook away from the clamor of society, where he is fed by ravens under a canopy of divine providence. In this divine sequester, Elijah's faith roots deeper into the fertile soil of trust. It's a marvelous illustration of God's methodology of sculpting our spirits through episodes of seclusion to fortify our faith, to tune our hearts to the celestial melody that guides us. In the stillness, away from the cacophony of routine, the whispers of God become coherent. The soft strums of His wisdom resonate through the silence. This divine separation is an abandonment. It's an invitation, a divine summons to a closer fellowship, to a deeper communion with Him. As Psalm 46.10 exhorts, Be still and know that I am God. It's in the stillness in the separation that our spiritual senses are home to perceive the divine intricacies of His plan. You might be traversing through a season where the world seems distant, where the heavens seem closer than ever before. Embrace it. See it not as isolation, but as a divine appointment, a celestial tete-a-tete intended to deepen your spiritual discernment, to enkindle a fresh fervor within your spirit. As you navigate through this sacred solitude, fear not the quiet, for it is the canvas upon which God sketches His magnificent plans for you. The moments of seclusion are not devoid of His presence. They are brimming with His undivided attention towards you. So in these moments of divine isolation, delve deeper into prayer, into the Word, and let your spirit soar in the boundless skies of His love and wisdom. The chosen ones set apart are cradled in the heart of God during these tranquil seasons. As we journey through life's winding paths, 
we often find ourselves meticulously crafting five-year plans, only to discover a divine detour awaiting us around the bend. This narrative might echo your own tale. Once a young hopeful with aspirations towards the courtroom, thriving in the bustling life of a law office, your heart was set, the goalpost was clear. Defending the voiceless and unveiling the truth were your envisioned daily bread. Yet life, with its whimsical humor, saw a different route. A shift in gears led you to the realms of business. A choice to follow a path perceived to be laden with golden leaves. The aim was to escape the shackles of debt, a common ghost haunting many ambitious souls. Yet despite this detour, a voice within remained restless, hinting at a larger scheme at play. This narrative unveils a universal truth. We are all beings of purpose, sailing on the sea of destiny, sometimes against the current of our own plans. The whispers of passion sometimes lead us to uncharted waters. For instance, a discovered love for writing might beckon, and suddenly a new horizon unfolds. The essence here is the profound simplicity of tuning into that inner compass over the clamor of external expectations. Amidst this journey, there are divine interludes, phases where the heavens beckon us to a pause, a holy hiatus. In these moments that a higher call seeks our attention, yet the hustle of life often drowns the celestial whisper. This phase of divine isolation although wrapped in solitude, carries a golden essence. It's an invitation to a sacred rendezvous, a call to sit at the feet of the divine, to receive the scrolls for the next chapter of our odyssey. The scripture resonates this truth in 2 Corinthians 6.17, unraveling a divine principle of separation for elevation. It echoes, Come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. This celestial pause is not a void, but a vessel of sanctification, a preparation for a holy assignment awaiting your spirit. It's a journey of shedding, an expedition towards holiness, mirroring the divine essence. This divine seclusion, although may seem like a desert, is indeed a fertile ground for spiritual evolution. It's a call to transcend, to shed the old and embrace the divine new. In this isolation, the mirror of truth is held high, reflecting the areas of our being awaiting illumination and transformation. The beauty of being chosen is unveiled in the sacred solitude, where the divine craftsman works on us, molding our essence for the grand narrative awaiting us. So as you find yourself in this divine pause, fear not, for it is the crucible of a higher calling, a prelude to a divine assignment. As Psalm 94, 19 states, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. The solitude, though initially perceived as an abyss, slowly unfolds as a realm of profound intimacy with the Lord. It's in the stillness that his whisper becomes audible his touch more tangible. The season of isolation isn't a punishment, but a divine invitation to a deeper fellowship. It's akin to the loving gardener who temporarily removes the plant from the crowded plot to nourish it individually, attending to its unique needs, pruning away the unfruitful branches, nurturing it to its fullest potential. Hebrews 12:11 elucidates, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The narrative of being cast away or punished is a mere illusion, a smokescreen by adversarial forces aiming to veil the magnificent work God is orchestrating in your life. Discard the fear and embrace the divine narrative. For in this unique narrative, your seemingly desolate valley morphs into a fertile ground where seeds of faith sprout, nurtured by the heavenly rains of grace. This isolation is not merely a phase of being set apart, but a sacred journey of being set apart for a higher purpose, 
Each moment of silence, each tear of longing, is a note in the divine symphony, a brushstroke in the celestial masterpiece being crafted. The solitude is not a realm of emptiness, but a canvas of divine possibilities. It's where the noise of the world dims and the melodious tune of divine wisdom resonates within the chambers of the soul. The process might bear a semblance to an ordeal, yet in reality it's a divine orchestration molding you into a vessel of honor fit for the master's use. In the scriptures, we find Jesus himself retreating into solitude before dawn, seeking the face of the Father. Mark 1, 35. And in the wilderness, he fasted for 40 days, drawing closer to God, away from the noise of society. There's a transcendent beauty in the solitude where the cacophony of the world fades and the still, small voice of God becomes the loudest sound. This chosen isolation is a crucible of transformation where the old self is shed, making way for a heart aligned with God's will. It's an area where repentance meets grace, where the superficial joy of worldly pursuits is replaced by a deep-seated joy that emanates from a communion with the divine. This joy isn't fleeting or dependent on external circumstances, but rooted in a love that endures through all seasons. As you navigate through this divine seclusion, you'll discover a flourishing intimacy with the Lord, a sweet fellowship that outshines the formal desire for worldly approval. The beauty of God's Word unfolds with a new profundity, becoming a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. When life seems to strip away the external, remember, it's a divine setup to enrich the internal. The temporary withdrawal from the bustle is an invitation to delve deeper into a relationship with God, to foster a heart of worship that thrives in truth and spirit. As earthly relationships may strain or shift, remember that your heavenly relationship is being fortified. The worldly may perceive this isolation as loss, but in the kingdom, it's a gain. A divine realignment positioning God as the paramount love of your life. Dear friends, if you find yourself in a season of divine isolation, fret not. Instead, embrace the solitude, knowing that within it lies a celestial workshop where the hands of God are sculpting your heart, preparing you for a divine purpose that far surpasses earthly understanding. And as you yield to this divine process, remember to anchor your hope in Jesus, the one who endured the wilderness before us and now walks with us through every season of isolation and growth. In Him we find our strength, our comfort, and our ultimate fulfillment. So fear not the solitude, for in it lies the unexpected beauty of being set apart for a heavenly calling. The scripture in Psalms 32.7 echoes this sentiment profoundly. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. This verse is a gentle whisper to our spirits, reassuring us that in the cocoon of God's love, we are shielded, nurtured, and prepared for the divine unveiling that awaits. In this sacred solitude, there's an internal alchemy at play. The old is being shed, making way for the new. The superficial is being chipped away, unveiling the authentic self that's rooted in Christ. Our perceptions are being refined to discern the eternal from the ephemeral. It's a journey not void of discomfort. The process of being molded may tug at the core of our being. But remember, the discomfort is fleeting, but the transformation is eternal. Embrace the process, lean into the tender embrace of the Creator, and allow the divine potter to mold, shape, and prepare you for the glorious unveiling that lies ahead. We are not abandoned. We are being prepared. We are not lost. We are on a sacred pilgrimage towards divine self-discovery. Our circumstances are not a detour. They are a part of a divine narrative that's unfolding, leading us closer to our Creator towards a deeper understanding of our purpose and a higher realization of our calling. 
As we traverse through the season of being set apart, let's attune our spirits to the heavenly melody that's orchestrating our journey, cherishing the profound metamorphosis that's taking place within, and looking forward with hope to the divine rendezvous that awaits. And when the time is ripe and the sculptor's work is done, we'll emerge from the cocoon of divine isolation, not with a spirit of loss, but with the wings of wisdom, love, and a higher resonance with the eternal. Our eyes will be open to the unforeseen beauty of being chosen and set apart, and our hearts will resonate with the heavenly tune of divine purpose and fulfillment. People can't ruin what they don't see. Imagine that God has blessed you with something unexpected or something you have been longing for, a new career, house, a car, or promotion. How do you share this news? Some post it on social media, visit their friends and family, or just blurt it out without considering the place and audience. This habit can get you into trouble. I know that it's hard to stay quiet about good things that are happening in your life, but I'm telling you that being too open has consequences most people don't really notice. There's a myth about how talking about good news and events can jinx them. Meaning some people notice that after they share a positive thing with someone, either it suddenly falls apart or a negative event occurs. Have you personally encountered this? Regardless of your answer, this message is not based on this myth, but rather on God's teachings. Luke 14, 7 says, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. God does not like a proud follower. This is why I'm about to discuss the concerning effects that can be brought on by oversharing about blessings, aside from the fact that it displeases God. I'll start with the first reason. When I say keep silent, the full version is keep silent when you're not with the right audience, because not everyone has a heart with good intentions. Most of us forget that when we communicate something, it's not just about the subject and how we deliver it. The process also involves the receiver of this message and their attitude towards the sender and the subject. This isn't random communication 101 trivia. My point here is that when you share something, regardless of how you do so and your intentions, if the heart of the audience is not in the right place, it defeats the purpose. Do you want to share news about your promotion with your coworker because you want the two of you to celebrate the journey so far? That's cool, but what if this person has a secret target on your back? What if they wanted the promotion that you got? It's definitely not your fault that you were blessed, but it won't be your fault either if they start to envy you. The thing is that when the world sees that you're being uplifted by God, they'll start to notice the vertical gap. They'll look up at you and wonder, why am I still down here? They want to have the kind of blessings you have, and sometimes they use this as friendly motivation. However, the ugly part is when it births envy, and they try to drag you down just so they won't feel left out. James 3.16 reminds us that, Wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and everything that is evil. The thing is that you can't control how they feel about God's work in your life. And again, you're not to blame for their unhappiness. Because of this, we tend to underestimate how their jealousy can ruin our peace. You might say, no one can be that committed to dragging me down. I'm telling you that there are wicked people out there who are capable of sabotaging you just so you stay at the same level as them. Do you notice how the ones who usually commit betrayal are people who are very close to the person they betray? Well, that's because they most likely hear more stories that fuel their bonfire of jealousy. Proverbs 6.34 also says that, Jealousy makes a man rage. He'll show no mercy on his day of revenge. It's pretty scary if you ask me. But if there's one thing you can do to mitigate the circumstances these jealous people are plotting against you, it would be safe to take this chance, don't you think? I'm referring to the practice of making sure that you are expressing yourself to your trusted circle only, such as family and close friends. They're the ones who understand the entirety of you and your story. 
They know who you are and where you've come from. Hence, they know better than to label you as a boastful individual. Your trusted circle understands the covenant you have with God, and their hearts are most probably after His, too. If something is that great and special, you ought to share it with people of the same qualities. The privilege of knowing the amazing details going on in your life should belong only to the people you truly value. Keep everything special to you private, because it's not everyone's business. When you keep every great blessing public, you're giving everyone the window to meddle with these things. Involving anyone and everyone means giving them access to your life and relationship with God. Besides, if you happen to share with someone who hates you, they're going to exploit it the moment they get the chance. As Galatians 5.26 instructs us, Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. I know that you have every intention of glorifying God by being vocal about His goodness, but this can be turned into a point of vulnerability by those who are competing against you. So keep silent when the conversation about God's blessings is not between you and your trusted circle. Next, when you can't stop talking about your blessings with other people, you're most likely downplaying God's instrumental role. Allow me to read Psalm 10, verse 4. The scripture that perfectly captures my point. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. I'm not saying that this is always the case, but you have to know that going around and telling people about your blessings can drive you to overlook God and his efforts. Have you ever noticed that when you share good news with someone, their responses are often compliments? They'll tell you that you deserve it or that you did such an amazing job. And even though these things are true, these compliments tend to nurture your ego to the point that you subconsciously undercredit God. People will praise and glorify you for this blessing, and it gets to you. As a follower, this is one of the scariest things that can happen because you know that God does not take pleasure in this attitude. However, it happens without you noticing it. In your mind, you're just sharing some great news, but it can condition you into believing that you deserve all the credit. That's what the devil can whisper to you. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 7 tells us, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? There's a fine line between taking pride in being blessed and having a God that blesses you. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 17 further commands, If you want to claim credit, claim it for God. Because in all honesty, the most important part of giving glory to someone is making sure that they are the one who hears it from you. The only thing God wants is to hear how much you delight in His grace and provision. He doesn't need you to broadcast it, for He has His own ways of showing His brilliance to other people. It's not necessarily your role to market God by making every single good thing known to the public. When you say that you want to testify about the blessings you've had, you have to make sure that the key focus is on God, not on your qualities that you think led you to receiving these gifts. An example of the latter is a person saying something along these lines. God blessed me with a car. I've been working so hard for it and that I've been doing quality work just to save up for one. I didn't expect to own a car this soon. He really sees what I'm doing. Do you notice the problem here? Not only is this person complimenting himself in a subtle way, he also tries to speculate about God's reasons for blessing him with a car. This downplays God's sovereign qualities and focuses on the receiver. So it's important that you take an honest look at how you verbalize God's generosity. So keep silent unless it is God who you truly are paying homage to. My dear friend in Christ, stay silent and let the blessing make the noise. Jeremiah 9, 23 through 24 reads, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, 
that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The truth is, there is no need to boast about whatever you have received from God. You only need to be vocal about the fact that God is mighty, real, and alive. God is incomparable. Blessing or no blessing, He wants us to boast about Him as the giver of life, eternal life, and everything in between, rather than the other blessings He gives us. If we partially change the narrative, it looks like this. Instead of saying, I got a new car today, try altering it to, the Lord consistently provides and He has done it again today. Do you see the difference it creates? The latter is more directed to our Father and it's a statement that straightforwardly credits Him for His greatness. We learn here that when we want to share God's blessings, we can do this by focusing on His actions instead of what He has given us. To sum it up, when God blesses you, keep silent unless you're with the right people and you're expressing your joy in a way that directly glorifies the Lord. This way you won't give other people room to destroy your moment while giving glory to God alone. There have been numerous occasions that I've encountered things and it felt like a message was being conveyed to me or that God was prompting me to do something at that precise moment. I want to explain the real reason why you should take these nighttime awakenings seriously, whether it's at 3 a.m. or any other time. I urge you to pay close attention because there's a deeper meaning to it. Before we embark on this enlightening journey, let's remember this fundamental truth. The world around us is not solely a product of chance. There's a spiritual dimension to everything we encounter. Whether it's the success we achieve or the challenges we face, spiritual forces are often at play, orchestrating events in ways we may not fully comprehend. So, when you find yourself repeatedly awakening during the stillness of the night, whether it's at 1 a.m. or the mysterious hour of 3 a.m., there is undoubtedly a profound spiritual significance behind it. It's time to unveil the reasons that lurk in the shadows, to understand what this mystical awakening truly means. Now, you may be wondering, what could possibly be happening at 3 a.m.? To shed light on this, let me share a parable a story that beautifully illustrates why delving into the spiritual realm is not only essential, but transformative. Once upon a time in a quiet village, there lived a diligent gardener named Sarah. Sarah possessed an uncanny ability to make her garden bloom like no other. Her flowers were vibrant, her trees bore the juiciest fruits, and her vegetables were the envy of the entire village. One moonless night, Sarah awoke suddenly, her heart racing. It was 3 a.m. and the world was cloaked in darkness. Rather than ignoring the strange awakening, she followed her instincts. Armed with a lantern, she ventured into the garden, guided by an inexplicable force. As she wandered through her garden, Sarah discovered something extraordinary. Her beloved plants, usually asleep at this hour, were bathed in a soft, ethereal glow. It was as if the heavens themselves were tending to her garden. She watched in awe as her flowers unfurled their petals. Her trees rustled with newfound life, and her vegetables glistened with radiant aura. In that moment, Sarah realized the profound truth. At 3 a.m., a sacred connection between heaven and earth unfurled. It was a time when the veil between the physical and the spiritual world grew thin, allowing heavenly blessings to descend upon the receptive. Just like Sarah's garden, your nighttime awakenings at 3 a.m. are an opportunity for divine intervention. It's when God wakes you up to converse with your soul, to infuse you with wisdom, and to guide you on a path. It's a call to prayer a chance to seek His presence and receive the spiritual nourishment your soul craves. In these sacred moments, embrace the silence and listen to the whispers of your heart. Let the stillness of the night be your sanctuary, a place where you can commune with the divine. Embrace the wakefulness as a gift, for it's during these hours that your spirit is most receptive to God's guidance. 
Now, when you pray to God, you're conversing with the creator of the universe, the great I am. Doesn't it make sense that you too should make a sacrifice when you enter his presence? Waking up at 3 a.m. to pray is your way of saying, Lord, I value being in your presence more than my slumber. I am devoted to you, committed to our relationship. It's a tangible act of love and commitment. At 3 a.m., the entire world is in a state of deep slumber, and even the spiritual realm rests in quietude. This is the hour when you can effortlessly connect with the Spirit of God. Your worship ascends to His altar like a fragrant offering, unhindered by the distractions of the waking world or the influence of evil spirits. Moreover, 3 a.m. is a time when you find yourself alone with God. It's during these hours of stillness that you can hear His still small voice with unparalleled clarity. Your prayers and worship during this sacred time will cause your spiritual life to flourish. You'll dive deeper into a profound relationship with God, knowing Him more intimately than ever before. And here's the beautiful part. God loves it. He's not just waiting for you to wake up. He's eagerly anticipating your arrival, even before you open your eyes. No need for an alarm clock, because He will wake you up with His gentle touch and loving presence. It's an exquisite experience that will fill your heart with warmth and peace. In the stillness of 3 a.m., you'll discover a connection with God that transcends the ordinary. It's a time for your soul to commune with the divine, for your spirit to soar in His presence. So the next time you find yourself awakened at 3 a.m., know that it's an invitation from the Almighty Himself. Embrace it as a gift an opportunity to draw nearer to the one who loves you beyond measure. You see, my dear friends, as a young Christian warrior, I too was awakened in the depths of night. I was compelled to discern the Spirit's movements, to seek divine direction with a fervent heart. And lo and behold, in that hushed embrace of night, an enlightenment descended upon me like a gentle breeze from the Almighty Himself. It was as if God had switched on a celestial spotlight, illuminating the path before me. His instructions were clear, and I embraced them with the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Why am I sharing this, you ask? Because I want you to understand that these nocturnal awakenings are not mere coincidences. They're the divine appointments, a divine rendezvous between you and your Creator, when the world slumbers and the night is still, God chooses this time to communicate with you, to impart His wisdom, His guidance, and His love. It's His way of saying, my child, I have something important to share with you. You may be tempted to dismiss these moments as fleeting, insignificant interruptions to your sleep, but my dear brothers and sisters, heed this warning. Ignoring these divine stirrings could rob you of your destiny. These awakenings are not meant to be ignored or brushed aside. They're meant to be embraced, cherished, and acted upon. In the silence of those early morning hours, the Spirit yearns to speak to you. It longs to share insights that can transform your life, bless your family, and elevate your purpose. These awakenings are not random. They are divine invitations to embark on a journey of spiritual discovery and growth. The Bible reminds us in Proverbs 3, 5-6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. When you wake up at 3 a.m., trust that God is aligning your path, straightening the course of your life, and guiding you towards His divine purpose. At times, the sinister forces of darkness may be at work, trying to cast shadows over your life, attempting to thwart your progress or inflict you with afflictions. But remember, God is your ultimate guardian, your heavenly Father who yearns for your well-being. He awakens you to say, My child, it's time to pray. Engage in spiritual warfare. The battles you face are not mere coincidences. Counter the enemy's designs and embrace your divine destiny. 
God's love for you is profound. When He stirs you from slumber, it's an act of love to shield you from the schemes of Satan. Moreover, those moments of sudden awakening may be God's way of inviting you to worship Him, to converse with Him, or to encounter Him on a deeper level. Think of it this way. Imagine you're a parent with two children. One child only comes to you in times of need or trouble, while the other seeks your presence out of love and longing. Which child's affection do you cherish more deeply? God desires that intimate connection with you, where you seek Him not only in desperation, but out of genuine love and devotion. The stillness of the night is a canvas where your faith can shine the brightest. In those sacred hours, you have the opportunity to deepen your bond with the Creator, to gain clarity on your life's purpose, and to stand resilient against the adversities that seek to undermine your faith. You see, at 3 p.m. on that fateful Good Friday, Christ offered Himself as a sacrifice for our sins. In the grand design of the universe, the devil often seeks to twist what God has ordained, and so he chooses the opposite time, 3 a.m., to orchestrate his misdeeds. But God's faithful, they rise at this hour, not out of fear, but out of love. To them, it's not just a prayer, it's a profound connection with the divine. It's a way to say, Lord, I love you, even in the stillness of the night. They view it as a penance, a beautiful sacrifice to show their unwavering devotion. It's a demonstration that even when the world sleeps, their hearts are wide awake in worship. Imagine the world at 3 a.m. The streets are silent. The world dreams. And even the spiritual realm rests. It's a moment when distractions fade away, leaving only you and the Lord. In this sacred solitude, you can hear His voice more clearly, feel His presence more profoundly. Now, let's talk about the Passio Domini, the meditation of Christ's Passion. This powerful practice takes place between Thursday night and Friday afternoon, where souls meditate on every agony, every suffering Christ endured, from His agonizing prayers in Gethsemane to His last breath on the cross. Some choose to stay awake all night, immersed in prayer and contemplation. By waking up at 3 a.m., they're saying, Lord, I want to walk beside you on the path of your suffering. I want to understand the depth of your love for me. And as they pray, they often turn to the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that encompasses their daily needs, their aspirations, and their devotion. It's a prayer that reminds them of God's eternal glory and His infinite power. As they recite, Our Father in Heaven, they're affirming their connection to the Almighty. You see, waking up at 3 a.m. to pray is a gesture of love. It's a commitment to seek God when the world is still silent, when distractions are minimal. It's a declaration that your relationship with the divine transcends the need for sleep. So, my friends, if you find yourself stirred from slumber at this sacred hour, know that you're not alone. You're a part of a communion that spans time and space, a fellowship of souls who understand the profound beauty of waking up at 3 a.m. to be with God. May this revelation ignite a spark within you. Embrace this divine rendezvous and let it fill your heart with love, hope, and unwavering faith. For this is why God wakes you up at night at 3 a.m., to draw you closer to Him to bless you with His presence and to remind you that you are truly loved.